morning and welcome to our time of worship. Today is Sunday the 18th of June, to which the Methodist Church is 11th Sunday, Sunday in ordinary time. And therefore our readings will reflect uh, that today. And one of those passages comes from the end of Matthew chapter 9, which will be my call to worship. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He told them the harvest is plentiful, yet the laborers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. We now have our first hymn reminding us of Jesus, who is all compassion, which is love divine, all loves excelling. Continue to praise God in our opening prayers. So let us pray. God, our generous hosts, we recognize as we pray that we have received so much from your hand. You have given us breath to live and to praise your name. You've given us food to strengthen us and water to refresh us. You've given us Jesus to be our friend, companion and saviour. 
We are glad to be your guests today. God, our gracious guest, we recognise as we pray that you come to us in so many ways. You whisper to us deep within our spirits when we feel alone. You show your love for us in the kindness of friends and strangers. You sit with us in our homes and walk with us on our streets. We are glad to welcome you today. God, you are both the ground of our being and the gift of life within us. Thank you for your gift of love, which has surrounded us all our lives. Thank you for the gift of grace, which accepts us as we are right now. And thank you for your gift of hope, which holds us now and for all eternity. Amen. We now sing our second song, which is Be Still. Our two Bible readings for today. A hundred. A psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us and we are his. We are his people the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen.
The reading is taken from Matthew 9, starting to read at chapter, at verse 35. Jesus went around visiting all the towns and villages. He taught in the synagogues, preached the good news about the kingdom, and healed people with every kind of disease and sickness. As he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them, because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he said to his disciples, the harvest is large, but there are few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John, the sons of Zebedee, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the patriot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus. These 12 men were sent out by Jesus with the following instructions. Do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. Go and preach, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, bring the dead back to life. Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases and drive out demons. You have received without paying, so give without being paid. Amen. Today I take as my text the words that Sylvia just read to us, that the harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest field. It's always daunting doing something on your own for the very first time. Maybe it was the first time we baked a cake and past mum was there to watch and guide us. Maybe our first time driving the car on our own with only a P plate to remind others that we're still a probationer driver. I can remember marvelling at my grandfather, whose shed was his workshop, and where he loved making things out of wood. As a small boy, I'd watch him make me toys, and when I got a bit older, he would let me have a go for myself. Sadly, I wasn't very good, and Grandfather soon took over again to finish the job. I'm sure the disciples had the same daunting feeling when Jesus was sending them out in twos to be apostles, which means the sent ones. In a sense, the passengers had to become the driver. And you could almost hear them say to Jesus, you want us to do it, and by ourselves however the exercise was not like putting together ikea furniture with only a funny drawing to follow for any instruction they had been with jesus and they had watched him and they saw him do it like me watching my granddad or following the teacher of our driving in, or the teaching of our driving instructor Jesus was also a leader who never expected his disciples to undertake tasks that he himself was not prepared to do. Yet Jesus faced plenty of opposition himself, and it would be no different for his sent ones as it is for us today. Sometimes we are surprised that opposition comes from unlikely sources. 
the Jesus whose mission was to proclaim God's kingdom. It was the religious leaders who were his greatest opponents. They twisted things around to try to explain that Jesus was only doing good because actually he was in league with the enemy, Satan, like one of those double agents in a spy movie. So if Jesus faced such opposition, can we expect any better treatment? The answer, of course, is no. But we are reassured if we remain faithful and obedient to Jesus, then our final vindication is God's. But how can we be sure of this if we are the ones he wants to send out into the world today? Well, I think we have two reasons to be confident. And the first one is this. That Jesus' motives, like perhaps many leaders today in our world, are true. And we hear that he had compassion. Compassion on the crowd, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They had no one to care for them, no one to lead them. Their earthly leaders, kings, princes, priests and generals had all failed them. And I wonder what Jesus might think now, looking at our world, especially over the last few years that we have lived. We've seen Russia's illegal occupation of Ukraine. And perhaps how many leaders failed their sheep in the light of poor responses to COVID-19. And the aftermath three years ago, of the violent death of George Floyd, Floyd, when it appeared that so many lives didn't matter as much as others. Jesus' ministry is a ministry of compassion, a compassion to put things right. And the second point is just that Jesus answers his critics by the consistency of what he is doing. And he keeps on doing it. The other agricultural image we find is the harvest field full of wheat, but lacks the harvesters to gather it in. We've enjoyed wonderful weather over the past few days. It's been a joy to go out late, well, midish evening, when the sun's about to set on the footpath from Akel to Fishley, seeing the field of barley and wheat waving in the wind, turning gold already, even though it's only mid-June. I look at that field of wheat and barley and know harvest time is imminent. That image seems very appropriate now. And Jesus will not stop until his compassion reaches out to all. And all have the opportunity to receive his love and salvation. Yet Jesus cannot bring in the harvest on his own. He wants others, just as eager as him, to bring in God's kingdom. Which means to see change that makes our world the way that God wants it to be. So he challenges his disciples, that they are to pray to the Lord of the harvest for more people to bring in that harvest of people's souls. I guess we've all said something like that. I wish there could be another powerful evangelist like Billy Graham or a keen young family will just turn up and join our church. Or there to be a sudden, sudden revival across the nation. All things meaning that God will find those other people that we need. However, I feel that Jesus was meaning that when you pray to the Lord of the harvest, the Lord may be saying that the answer to your prayer is you. You are the ones to work in 
the harvest field. This reminded me of a situation within a couple of years of me becoming the minister of Trinity Methodist Church in Deerham. We just completed a building project and one of our members had the vision to pay for leaflets to be given out and put through the houses and the doors of the streets around our church on the northern side of Deerham. We were not just to put the leaflets for the letterbox, but in pairs to knock on the door and say who we were and what the leaflet was about. Somebody said at the church council meeting, what if they set the dogs on us? However, we agreed to do it over two nights in June, about this time of the year. As 16 people agreed, we went out in eight pairs. The church felt that they had to be the labourers going out into their own field. So what's the purpose of Jesus sending out apostles, his sent ones. In chapter 10 in St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says it's to restore the lost sheep, but only the lost sheep of Israel. And this seems to run against a passage we looked at only a couple of weeks ago when it was Trinity Sunday, the great commission to make disciples of all nations. And even earlier in chapter 8 in St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus speaks of the people of the world, the Gentiles, coming from east and west, flooding into God's kingdom. So we may ask here, it seems we're going backwards and thinking too small. However, this was the first time the apostles were going out alone. And we all have to start somewhere. And maybe it's those who are nearest to us is the good place to begin. For the first disciples, it was fellow Israelites like them. And maybe for us, those who are nearest to us as well. Going back to the story in Deerham. We went out to people's homes on the streets near the church. When we all returned back, we had positive stories to share. The dogs indeed were not set upon us. Remember with my wife Sarah, the positive comments from people, including a person in her 20s who came out of her home to say how glad she was that we had taken the time and the interest in wanting to meet with her. Also, in that command, the sent ones were commissioned to restore the lost sheep. Jesus' ministry given to us is to restore, to bring life and hope to others. And what I believe we are seeing in our world today is a desire for change. And a world that values all and doesn't favour the select few or the status quo. The world, I believe, is now ripe, like the harvest field, ready for harvest. People are eager for change and to hear a message of real hope and to offer a fresh start. So we are the answer to our own prayers. We go out with a message of restoration to a new life of hope because God firstly has restored us to be people of life and hope. We don't spread good news because ultimately we hope to benefit from others who will respond to the message. That's why Jesus told his disciples not to take money with them nor lots of equipment but instead to travel light. For by offering a no-strings-attached message of generosity, we may find that people respond with kindness. This is not a criticism. I know in some churches a sign of the pastor's success 
can be measured by the size of the luxury car that mostly he drives. I remember visiting a church once. Where all the pastors had large Mercedes or Jaguars on the church car park. We should travel light. But equally, we should not think of ourselves like beggars either. For Jesus forbid his disciples to take a bag for the journey. And we are expected. And we don't expect others to keep us. Instead, be thankful for returned kindness and generosity. I know hospitality is not easy in our current climate, when people are having to meet high energy bills and the cost of living crisis, and income that does not keep up pace with all this. But a church is truly more effective in its mission to restore when we are seen as welcoming and hospitable places. I remember a very wise retired minister in my first church in Manningtree in Essex, who encouraged us to become a welcoming and hospitable community. It's easy to create mission statements that say the right words than it is to actually live it out. We all need reminding that everything we have comes from a generous God. Freely we have received, so freely we should give. And may we who are the sent ones during this coming week freely give our love and share God's compassion with all. And may God send us out to do this task with generous and welcoming hearts. Amen. And now we sing our next thing, which is, Will You Come and Follow Me? Will you quell the fear inside? 
and sound in you and you in me. Lord, your summons echoes true in you, but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow. Now have our prayers for others, so let us pray. Loving Jesus, you went about teaching and proclaiming good news. We pray today for all who teach in our schools, in our churches, in hospitals and prisons, those who teach at home. Remember by day those known to us who teach and those who are taught. We pray for the church, your body here on earth, seeking to proclaim good news for our ministers and preachers, for all of us, that we may by our lives demonstrate your goodness and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Jesus, you went about curing every disease and every sickness. We pray today for all who work in so many ways to bring healing and wholeness. Remember by name those known to us who work for healing and those who are in need of healing today. We pray too for the church, your body on earth, seeking to continue your work of healing for chaplains in hospitals, hospices and care homes, and for all of us, that we may, by our lives, bring wholeness and healing to our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Jesus, you had compassion on those who were harassed and helpless. We pray today for all who seek to offer support and guidance for those who feel lost. For counsellors, citizens' advice volunteers, charity workers, self-help groups and community leaders. Remember by name those who serve the communities where we live. We pray also for the church, your body on earth, seeking to offer strength and direction, purpose and acceptance. May we, by our lives, invite others to taste your compassion and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Jesus, you lived in such a way that demonstrated that the kingdom of heaven was close. We pray for our world, 
which at times seems far from your kingdom. May each of us be given courage, compassion and grace today and throughout this coming week that we may bring the kingdom a little closer to someone that we know. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we bring together all our prayers, spoken and silent, as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Today, our final hymn is number 391, O oh, Breath of Life, Come Sweeping Through Us. As we rise and continue with our day, as we go out to face the week, as we step from the focused moment of worship into the lifetime of worship, travel with us, holy God. Show us how to love one another as you have loved us. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit Remain with us forevermore. Amen.